My name is Jason Moore. Uh, I uh, run a company and a ministry called Midnight Oil Productions. Uh, I have met many of you for the last, gosh, five or six years. I've been working with the Susquehanna Annual Conference, uh, the leadership reports that you've seen. Uh, last year I had um, people sitting around campfires and doing uh, fun little sketches and things like that. Um, and so it's been a, an honor to work with your conference for the last few years. And uh, I'll introduce you to my friend, uh, Rosario Picardo. You want to tell them a little yep. bit about yourself? So um, I'm a church planner by trade. Um, more recently, I've been the executive pastor of New Church Development at Ginghamsburg Church for the last five years. And I planted a multi-ethnic congregation called Mosaic Church. That's in Dayton, Ohio, um, and you can be praying for Dayton because we just had seven tornadoes come through, and so we've been fielding a lot of messages for the last day and a half. Um, and I'm also the dean of the chapel at United Theological Seminary, so I wear a lot of different hats, and I'm a church plant coach as well. So uh, before we get started, I wouldn't mind if you would join me in prayer, and uh, then we will uh, jump into this conversation about franchise to local dive. God, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity to be gathered here together in this place. Uh, we pray that you would bless the work, uh, the worship, all the things that are going to happen over the next few days. Uh, join us in this conversation. Pull up a seat and, and sit with us in these moments as we explore what it looks like uh, to create a contextual ministry that reaches the world that we live in. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, let me repeat your order here. That'll be one double cheeseburger, ching. Large fries, no large soda, ching. -ching. Two kids meals and two medium sodas, ching. To all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed. Bam. Yo quiero Taco Bell. Cheese stays hot, the cool stays crisp. Put it together, you can't resist. Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. Where's the beef? Now, in the early 70s, they started serving sandwiches. On in 77, they introduced the burger. The rest is history. This is Langford Grocery. The spices that they use, amazing. It's starting to tear up. They're burger tears. Happy tears. They're definitely not your cookie cutter burger. Can't get it anywhere else. Two double meat cheeseburger. Handmade, like your grandmother used to make. The way they've been making them here since 77. Yep, guys, enjoy. They'll cook anything that you want, especially for the regulars. They customize it. Hey, here we go, George. She'll even name one after you. Grim burger. This is the elusive Mr. Grimm with Edie's homemade mac and cheese. Why not put it on a burger with jalapenos, bacon, and egg? What they all fit together pretty nice. This is a good old hole in the wall. Everybody's nice. The food is great. Enjoy. This is definitely our favorite burger place. You, my friend, I will tell you something. <laughs> I've done an outstanding job. You got a lot to be proud of. Thank you, sir. Great job. <laughs> Now, some of you in the room look old enough to remember some of those early commercials. How many of you remember Where's the Beef? You know, uh, I don't know about you, I love the nostalgia of those old commercials, but when I think about where I want to go eat, I would much rather join Guy Fieri, the guy at the end of the video, as he goes out and, uh, and hits those uh, diners, drive-ins, and dives. How many of you have seen the show Diners, Drive-ins, and Dives? Uh, you know, Guy goes all over the country and he finds these little dives that nobody knows about or well the locals know about but they're not famous places with famous names you'll never see him walk into an applebee's or a, a red lobster or something like that but he always finds these little out of the way off the beaten path uh, restaurants and uh you know uh, we're going to talk today about what it's like to go more on that journey than it is to be on on the franchise uh, journey we're not here today to talk to you about hamburgers uh, we're here to talk to you today about how do we serve up the gospel in a way that makes sense for the local context. Uh, there's the tendency sometimes in thinking about starting something new uh, to want to just sort of take what already exists, the franchise, whether that be a denominational franchise, a successful church franchise, a church that's already doing something, starting a new service, and just copying what's already there, uh, but imposing sort of this franchise the local dive is really all about finding that local flavor and context and speaking to it. And so we're going to talk about starting new, uh, new things. It may be a new campus that you'd start. It may be a new worship service that you'd start. And we're going to explore what that looks like. Uh, Roz and I flew here yesterday from uh, Dayton, Ohio. Um, and uh, we, had to, we flew through Chicago which uh, we, we escaped tornadoes only to go to Chicago where we weren't sure if we were going to get out because of more weather. <laughs> right. And we had a long layover, a three-hour layover. Now, when we landed in Chicago, I was pretty hungry. 
Roz was not yet hungry. I said, hey, I want to go find something to eat. And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll watch our bags. I'm not really hungry yet. So I went searching for something to eat. And I found this restaurant that had burgers. Uh, I think it's Irish. Um, it's a Mick, uh, McDonald's is what it was called. And I, I was feeling kind of sad, so I got a happy meal. I thought that might make my day happier because of, uh, and you know, um, I think they spent more time on the toy inside of this than the actual food that was in the box. And I came back to Roz and he said, what did you get to eat? And I said, well, this is what I got to eat. And uh, he just looked at me and, and shook his head, you know. Um, now, Roz was smarter than I. He, he got hungry a little later. Yeah, and I got a real burger this yeah, time. Tell him where you so, went to eat. Um, I, I went to a, a tank burger is what I ended up getting. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference compared to his burger because his is a little bit more artificial and probably didn't settle well in your stomach. No. Um, not that this was any better, but it tasted better. <laughs> um, but what I did tell Jason was some of the ingredients that were in his McDonald's meal. You want to hear some of this ingredients? You probably um, don't want to hear these ingredients. Well, <laughs> I told you after the fact, um, propylene glycol, a substance similar to that found in antifreeze. Um, the International Business Times calls this additive the less toxic version of ethanol glycol, which is a dangerous antifreeze. So it doesn't it, sound too appetizing, does it? It tasted really good, though. <laughs> Ammonium sulfate used to encourage dough to rise in fast food buns. That's not too appetizing that's, that's, either. That's great stuff. You say this should, next one. May, I don't think I can say any of those things. Uh, yes, that's one of the characters. In, <laughs> that's one of the characters in the New uh, Old Testament, I think. Um, yeah, I read that book once. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should show. You know, this is what I was eating. This is what Roz ate. 100% whole wheat bun, 100% USDA uh, choice Angus beef, and uh, <laughs> the reason we share this with you is that so much of what we do when we try to start something new is sort of do the overprocessed version of it. It's dangerous to go to a conference like this and hear experts get up and talk about something because you kind of want to take it home and copy exactly what they did. And oftentimes, it's a bunch of ingredients that don't really fit your scenario. Uh, and, and while it, you, know, you can punch out very, um, the, the burgers are all the same size and they're all mm -hmm. shaped the same and, and everything is identical. Perfect. Uh, there is something that is missing in the flavor of what we do when we start something new when we're just ripping off or copying what other people are doing. And so today is going to be all about how do you form a recipe that works for your setting. Yeah, and um, to add to that, Jason, um, a lot of times when you come to workshops like this too, you hear about people's highlight reels. We want to share some of the failures that we've experienced and some of the missteps as well. Um, one of my favorite books of the Bible is actually from Nehemiah um, in the Old Testament. And in the book of Nehemiah, we see a meal that is served up with natural seasoning, the Word of God. And so um, I'm sure you're all, you're all Bible scholars, so you're familiar with Nehemiah. But Nehemiah uh, was a cupbearer, so his job was to drink the cup before the king did, uh, the cup of wine, because back then when they want to poison the king, they would do it through his wine. So talk about on-the-job hazards, Nehemiah had them. Uh, pretty good job, though, of drinking wine. That was his, that was his gig. And then um, he had this burning desire to rebuild the wall. We know the wall was in ruins, and he rebuilds the wall with the king's permission. Nehemiah is a man of God, even though he's not a priest. Uh, he hears from God. He's not a prophet, but he acts like one. Um, he's not royalty. He's just, he's a butler is what he is. But it's interesting because when you read the book of Nehemiah, revival doesn't break out until they discover the book of the law again. They discover the book of the law again, and they serve a meal to the people. And it's not even Nehemiah who does it. Anybody remember who does? Ezra. I was going to say Ronald McDonald. Ronald I'm McDonald. So glad that they answered for you. <laughs> and here's what it says in Nehemiah. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, says this. In October, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. 
They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read out loud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. So are you picturing this scene? So what's taking place is the, the, the deportees are coming back. There's about 50,000 of them that are returning. The, the book of the law had been lost until Ezra discovers it again. They have no temple to go into. And so Ezra goes out to who? The people. He goes out to the people and he doesn't entertain them. He doesn't um, do a song and dance for them. All he does is read scripture. And the people were hungry for it. And we're told, some scholars believe that it lasted about six to eight hours. I don't think I could listen to you preach for six to eight hours. I couldn't listen to me preach for six to eight minutes. Um, no, but six to eight hours. And so as he's reading the law, the, the people are out amongst the Levites translating everything, cooking up the, the, uh, the meal in a flavor that they could understand. The people begin to weep because they hear it for the first time in their language. I think so often when we're trying to start something new, we start with what we already know. And we're very churchy about the way that we do it. And we require people to learn how to like our flavor rather than delivering it in a flavor that the people can understand. You know, especially when you take these kind of big box churches that just kind of move into a neighborhood and don't really do the work of learning what the culture of the neighborhood is. Uh, the reason the people are so moved is that for the first time ever, the meal is being cooked up in a flavor like that's, that's our local cuisine. And it's interesting because the story kind of ends where they all have a big banquet and they go mm -hmm. have a meal together. Yep. Um, but that's, that's really what we're talking about is, is, is how do we translate the gospel? How do we put it into terms, into language, uh, in, in a palatable form for those uh, whom we are trying to reach today? Uh, we're going to share with you, uh, our goal today is not to say, here are five recipes, pick one of them and go home and cook from it. Uh, you've got to figure out what your recipe is. And what we would like to do is to expose you to some different recipes that we've seen work. Uh, we want to give you kind of five ingredients that you might think about. And we're going to have kind of some reflection questions that we want to give you a chance to, to think about and answer even today as you sit here. Uh, and again, this may be that you're just going to start a new faith expression at your church. Maybe you're going to start a new worship experience. Maybe you're thinking about how to do something new in, a, in another location. Uh, start another campus, whatever that might look like. Uh, we think all of these things apply. All right, so let's talk about the first one. Uh, Roz and I both uh, coach a lot of churches. Um, Roz has done a lot of work with uh, church planters. I've done a lot of work in uh, revitalizing uh, congregations. I've worked with some church starts too. Uh, but one of the things we see all the time is that people go into this without really assessing what the need is in their community. They think, we'd like to reach more people. Our church is dying. We've read the demographic reports. There are lots of unchurched people here. That's not enough of a need to start something. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing. And we thought maybe the best way that we could uh, help you think about the why was by sharing a clip that we saw that inspired us to think more about the why uh, in, in what we do. The what is what, is what you're going to do is, is start something new, but you've got to know the why. Uh, take a look at this clip. This is called How Do I Know? Oh, that's a short clip. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, it was set not as a foreground, but as a background. That's not good. I did this on purpose to make you feel comfortable that a media guy doesn't even know how to run this stuff. <laughs> this is called, this is called how, do I... how Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what, the key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every 
Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular, I'm about to show you a clip to, we were in, uh, we were in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid, I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that says. So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. A lot of times we know our what, but we have difficulty finding our why. Uh, when it comes to franchises, not that we're dog in the big box at all, but a lot of times their why is to make profit, right? But for a lot of local establishments, especially the ones that I know in Dayton, it's more than just creating an income stream, it's creating an environment, a place for community. So one of the places that I often frequent is Lily's Bistro. In fact, my first daughter's name's Lily. Uh, that's why we let like go in there, but it's unique because every single day they change the menu. It's a rotating menu. And not only is it a rotating menu and has a good environment, but all the time they're doing different fundraisers. They tithe at least what they bring in to the community. Now they don't know that they're tithing, but they probably give back in more ways than some of the local churches in the Dayton area. And their job is simply this, to create an environment. They know their why to build community. And so when we think about making disciples, it's really about making an impact, not about cookie cutter, not about being sterile and stale and predictable and copying what other churches have done, but what God has uniquely created you to do in your local church by discovering the seasoning and the flavoring. Yeah, can you imagine uh, creating worship that is so different that you do different things all the time. You know, they serve a different menu every day and that's how they keep it real for people. And so often we're so locked into one form of worship and, and making sure that everything is so defined in that one practice. We get upset if people sing a song at the wrong time, you know, or, <laughs> or just tweak one little thing. 
Um, but if we want to attract people and retain those people, we have to serve things up in a, in a different way. Um, one of the things that uh, we talk about in, in this new uh, book, we, I don't know if I mentioned, we, uh, our new book, Franchise to Local Dive, will be coming out in the fall where we really, we only have 90 minutes with you, so we get to just scratch the surface a little bit. But we're inspired by the food truck movement. You know, the food trucks are kind of the new incubators of innovation when it comes to, uh, to the food industry because there's not a lot of investment. They can tweak and, and change the recipe without having to worry about brick and mortar. There's a, a famous uh, hot dog shop in our area uh, called Zombie Dogs. And uh, they started out of a food truck and everywhere they would go, people would come from all over the place to line up and buy a zombie dog. And now they have a, a store location and they've lost a little bit of their edge. And we just read uh, last year that they're talking about making sure they get back out into that food truck because that's where all of their innovation began to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we want you to hear that because sometimes when we get in our, our buildings and our spaces uh, locked into our longtime traditions, we start to lose some of the innovation that made us uh, grow in the first place. So to have more of that food truck mentality than that brick and store uh, mentality, uh, and brick mention, and mortar. And um, you know, this came about, what happened in 2008? The, the economic, yeah, the economic downturn happened. These and people so don't live in our, our country. Our, well, in Dayton, <laughs> yeah. In Dayton. We it got hit really Dayton. hard. Yes. But you know, the economic downturn. So this caused a lot of uh, store owners to have to rethink. And so a lot of times uh, when we think of being entrepreneurial and doing something new, it usually comes about by solving a problem or addressing a specific issue. And so a lot of restaurants had to close and that's why we see the food truck industry again taking off. So uh, thinking about knowing that need, uh, it's, it's really important that even if you've had success in the past, you don't rely on that past success to inform what you're going to do next. I mean, you can learn a lot about what you've done well, but you still have to know your why. We have a, a, a great friend uh, in ministry named George Acevedo. He is a pastor of a church in, uh, actually multiple churches in uh, Miami, Florida, um, that area down there, uh, called Grace Church. And uh, George, uh, and I, George and I, um, uh, Roz actually, uh, the church Roz was at, brought George in for a, a conference and uh, we had a, a night at my house where we all were sitting around shooting the breeze and, and became pretty good friends. And so we're Facebook friends and George uh, goes back and forth with us pretty regular commenting. And I remember in the, I think it was November of 2016, uh, him posting a picture standing in Sioux Falls, South Dakota with snow all around him saying, this is really hard for this Florida boy to be starting a new church in Sioux Falls. And I thought, what on earth is George Acevedo doing? All of their churches are in, you know, southern, southern Florida, sunshine state. And here he is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I noticed in, uh, I think it was like May or April, uh, a post on his Facebook account that said, um, Really proud of our team. We gave it our best shot. Um, this is our final Sunday here in Sioux Falls, uh, the Grace Campus. And so when we were putting this book together, I called George and I said, hey, would you, I know this is really vulnerable, but would you talk to me a little bit about what happened? And George uh, spent, gosh, a good hour on the phone with me uh, being vulnerable and sharing some of what they learned. And uh, a big part of it was, so the circumstances were interesting. One of his uh, campus pastors had a son who had moved to that area and she wanted to go be closer to her son, but she said, I'm going to miss Grace so much, I wish I could take Grace with me. And the bishop in that area is a big fan of what Grace is doing and said, well, hey, uh, what if you planted a Grace campus here and your pastor that's coming up here could run it, we'll, we'll work together with you to fund it. And the problem was they never really asked the why question, why, why are we going to do this? I mean, it was that she wanted to take Grace with her, but... Uh, they didn't think about their target audience. They didn't think much about Sioux Falls. So uh, in reflecting on why it, why it didn't work, George said there were kind of two big lessons they learned. Uh, the first was that they are, he called it, we're rehab addicts. What we do is we rehab churches. We take a church that is dying, uh, falling apart. We infuse really good DNA, good systems, good structure. We rehab them. And, uh, and, and bring them back to health. 
Well, this was a church start. This was a build it from the ground up. We had never done that before. We'd never even asked ourselves, could we do that? Uh, the second thing, and this was probably the bigger problem, was that um, they're a recovery church. So they uh, deal with people with addictions. They help, uh, you know, in every way they can uh, rehabilitate those people. And when they got to uh, Sioux Falls, they found out there were two ministries to it that had been in place for many years uh, that had pretty much every base covered. And so there really wasn't a need for another recovery ministry in that community. So they got there with everything that they knew, all the success they had before, without their why. And it only took you know six months or whatever for it to fail because they really didn't understand what it was they were doing. So you have to assess the need. You have to know your why. And if you don't know your why, what you're creating will not succeed. Now, George did tell us that... Um, this was in place before, but they've really gone back to this and started to look at what they call their playbook. Uh, it's the way that they determine their why. And I wanted to share these four things that they filter everything through so that they know their why. Uh, the first is uh, reach. What is the reach of the ministry that we're doing? Uh, this is ministries that engage and invite unchurched people into their community to experience the love of Jesus in the body of Christ. Uh, next thing in is, is connect, and they're, they're always looking for uh, ministries that help people connect to Jesus and the Grace Church family. Uh, the third thing is form. So these are ministries that help people, uh, that help people uh, grow and transform in relationship with Jesus Christ. And then finally, send. And these are ministries that released uh, God's people to make the realities of heaven the realities of earth. And so they, he said to me, we didn't really filter what we were doing in Sioux Falls through this playbook as well as we could have. And, and had we done that, we probably would have known our why and we might have had a different outcome. Uh, so uh, we just cannot overemphasize that when you are being strategic about starting something new, how important it is to spend some time visioning around what it is. I mean, there are always going to be unchurched people around you. There are always going to be, hopefully, new people moving to your area. That is not a, enough of a why. You have to know who it is you're trying to reach, why you're trying to reach them, how you're going to go about that, and then you start the work of starting something new. And if, if, you, uh, if you don't uh, get that initial strategy of deployment in place ahead of time, it'll never take. And this applies to also revitalizations too. So I'm sure many of you are in revitalization work because nowadays if you're not planting a church, you're revitalizing a church. And so a lot of what we're sharing you can apply because I've done both. Um, if I thought church planning was hard, restarting a church just about killed me. Uh, so I know it's a struggle. And assessing the needs he, he of the community. He had all of his hair. When he yeah, I had, a full, I had his, more hair than Jason, That's I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so assess the need. So we're going to ask you, I, I mentioned this before, but a series of uh, reflection questions. If you're here with someone today, we're going to give you a couple minutes to just talk about uh, these reflection questions. If you're here by yourself or you don't want to talk to your neighbor, uh, that's okay. Um, we're going to give you a chance just to maybe make some notes uh, in front of you. The series is called, How Do I we Know? Watch that. We don't want to watch that again. All right. Our first reflection question is, if you're starting something new or revitalize, revitalizing something old, do you know your why? The second thing is, are you attempting to live outside of your why? In other words, that's what we saw with George. If you're trying to do something that's not you, you can't just copy what somebody else is doing and try and do what somebody else is doing, but you got to figure out your own why. So we're going to give you two minutes uh, to talk with each other about that, and then we will uh, jump into our next ingredient. So go ahead and converse with your... My introverts in the room are like, I shouldn't have come to this workshop. <laughs> All right, you can begin.
Got my red shirt. That's my favorite. Rich, I am okay. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? Good. Everything okay? It's good. Hey, good to see you. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yes. I will. like really good later we can look back and say <laughs> so when it's really good later we can look back and say oh that was our first one alright 10 seconds alright pencils down <laughs> does anyone want to share uh, what their why is did anybody have a why for starting something new? You look like you want to say something. Yes. Yeah. Well, we were talking because we started a, a, new, a service, a new service. Yep. Yeah. And we're revitalizing. We're starting a new, we're merging with the church. So awesome. we're kind of in the midst of both, so we're like, oh my. Okay. Going on. So, yeah. are, you, are you leading worship there? Well. Because, I mean, I just was, I still remember it how awesome you were last year and singing for us in that presentation. So, uh, very good. Good, good. I think I know what you're singing because I helped plan that. Uh, good. Anybody else? Did, did you determine your why? So our why like, was a practical part, like the second service of the one, the one church where three churches. So it was just a practical part. Like, man, I was space. Okay. Mm -hmm. Focus us on getting out of the practical reasons and getting back to mm -hmm. more and more of our leadership team is going to conferences and everything, and we, we come back so refocused on mm -hmm. yes, why. yes, cool. I've seen churches. I'm working with a church right now that um, I was assigned by our conference. I'm from, we're from the West Ohio Conference uh, to coach them through starting a new worship expression. So they're doing a quote contemporary service. I hate that word. Um, I'll say more about that later. Um, and uh, they do these unity services on the fifth uh, Sunday. If there's a fifth Sunday, they bring both the traditional and the non-traditional together. And they, they say, we really love the way that feels when everybody's in the room together. And uh, they said, we're thinking about just combining it all into one service. And I, please don't do that. <laughs> so I convinced them twice when their board met not to do it, and then about uh, three weeks ago, they informed me that we unanimously decided to combine our service into one. And I said, that's so inwardly focused because you don't know your why anymore. You don't know what, st what kind of worship are you doing while well, we're doing blended worship. Here's the problem with blended worship. You give everyone something to hate in the same worship service. <laughs> you say, we don't like drums and guitar. I don't like hymns. Let's do hymns with drums and guitar. Now everyone hates it. And it makes it really hard to grow something if, you don't, if you're kind of lukewarm in the middle of sort of this and we're sort of this. Uh, so I said, you have to determine your why. And I, I didn't win that battle. But it's going to be really hard for them to grow because there aren't a lot of people out there that are looking for something sort of lukewarm in between. I want something that's sort of this and sort of this, but neither of those two things. So I would just encourage you to hit hard not that that's, I know you're not saying you're combining everything. It does feel better to have a lot of people in the room, but the other thing that I said to them, uh, and I'll get back on topic here, uh, was that um, those fifth Sundays, you know you only have to live through that one Sunday of compromising the style of worship that you love, and then next week we'll go back to the tradition that we love, or the contemporary that we love. But when everybody combines into one thing, or you make it all one big deal, you start to lose something that you loved about what was there before, and there's... You got to, it has, the vision has to be the platform that you build everything else from. So I just encourage you to, to stick And your that. new worship average will be what the lowest attended service was. You give it some time. Usually a rule of thumb. 
And you know, you probably know about the 80% rule too, right? Yeah, so once you reach 80% of capacity in the room. And I even say 70 nowadays. Yeah, it's it's hard to grow a service because new people come in and it's it's hard to integrate when the room is, is that full. So uh, sometimes it feels really good to have a lot of people in the room, but it, it makes it hard for an outsider to integrate into your community, so. Bob, did you have yeah, a? Yeah, um, we've been toying with the idea. We live, we're in a building that is, sits on five acres, and around us is heavy, densely populated, and many, many pet owners. In fact, the apartment, massive apartment, townhouse across the street, their why is uh, pets. They yeah. have everything. So we've been thinking about that same idea. How can we be this sort of haven, at least the summertime, that's great. Small dog park. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> but in fact, there are many around us. Okay. So we did things that Blessing of the animals. <laughs> drinking bowls. For yeah, that. yeah. It's, it's great. Place. Yeah, so and... sometimes we call that kind of affinity group style worship communities, you know, so it can be around sports or art or pets or whatever. And if, if that's your why and you live into that, you build, you build the structure around that. I mean, obviously it's about Jesus first, uh, but, but you build around that affinity and that, that can have a Start, whole lot of value. Right. Yeah. And, and the church in the past is about how do we keep pet owners out? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that's right. The no dogs right. in the sanctuary. Right. <laughs> right. And, and even not even on the ground. Yes. You know? Yeah. And now we're trying to <laughs> yeah, very good. All right, well, we'll uh, we're going to have multiple opportunities to, to converse throughout this time, so uh, we will keep moving ahead on our ingredients list here. Yep. Uh, that brings about the second ingredient, assess the relationship. I remember when I was younger, we had this thing called DTR, define the relationship, like when you were courting or, or dating somebody, and so you wanted to figure out, are we really dating? Is it a match? all that kind of fun stuff. So um, whether it's planting a church or it's a new worship service, it's um, really important to be able to decide um, what it's going to look like. Is it going to look similar to something that already exists, whether it's a parent church or a prior church service? So uh, picture this continuum right here. Um, Independent is on my right side, interdependent on my left. So interdependence more the franchise. It's what's going to be really identical. It's what's, you know, it's the child's going to look like the parent or the second worship service is going to look like the first. And then independent is there's going to be variation in there. So when you look at those two things, it's important uh, to be, and we'll go over the different components of that, but it's important to have what we call a covenant in place. And when you're able to have a covenant in place, then you're able to create different expectations um, because you may be starting a new worship service and really upsetting other people when they don't know. Um, they think it's maybe going to be identical to what is already going on. Same um, music style or preaching or teaching. It could be totally different. And so an example of this is um, a mistake that I made. Well, it's not really a mistake, but it kind of is. Um, so I planted a new church year and a half ago, and it was out of Ginghamsburg Church. And launch Sunday, 564 people. I mean, God moving in some awesome ways. Um, you know, we had 33 baptisms this past Easter. So like we, we've seen a lot of great things happen. However, it doesn't look anything like the mother church. Not one bit. The preaching doesn't. Uh, the teaching, the discipleship pathway, the branding, um, everything is totally different. So that created a lot of friction. Um, but if we would have set out at the beginning on this continuum what things were going to look like, it could have saved me some heartache. So now when I'm working with planters and with different pastors, we actually chart this out. And we'll get into the different ministry areas because um, that'll determine what they look like as well, if they're going to look like the parent church. We want to reiterate here that you can be on either side of this continuum. So it can be interdependent. I mean, there are churches that are doing this well where they have kind of little franchises. They might have five different locations and they all look the same. Uh, but you can have this extreme too yeah. where uh, the, the planted church or even the worship service uh, again, we want you to hear, as we say campuses, we realize many of you in this room are not going to start another campus, 
Uh, many of you may just be starting a second worship experience, uh, a new faith expression, whatever you want to call that. Um, that can look like a totally separate thing or it can look identical to what's there. Mm -hmm. What we want to stress here is that tension really builds if you don't determine this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what, what Ra's experience with Ginghamsburg was there were resentments that started to form when they didn't do the same series. Uh, talk about the, the series. Yeah, Jason got me in trouble. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I did. Yeah, we, we would do different um, worship series and sermon series and different things like that uh, because we didn't set this out ahead of time. So well, and, that would and, have helped. And part of it was that Ginghamsburg is in kind of an upper middle class area. Mm -hmm. uh, Roz was planting... Uh, A multi-ethnic church. Yeah, it, that, that looks very different. So sometimes something that worked in the franchise, you know, in that... Quite honestly, Lily, Lily white. white community mm -hmm. um, didn't work so much when you're in a, a multicultural kind of setting. Uh, so uh, when you're deploying uh, your new thing... Uh, and there are advantages to both of these. Right, absolutely. So. We have a, a friend, um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Jacob Armstrong. Jacob is a pastor um, in uh, Tennessee. And he, uh, he's actually got the second fastest growing United Methodist Church in the country right now. And uh, his, the church is called Providence Church. About a year and a half ago, they sort of adopted another church that's called Home Church. And uh, they are part of uh, Providence, but they didn't change the name of the church to be like Providence West. Uh, they didn't change the color scheme or the branding so that it all looked the same. In fact, uh, we interviewed him for the book, and Jacob was telling me that maybe 20% of that other congregation <laughs> even knows there's a connection between the two. Now, you've had some conversation with him. What are some of the ways that they're partnering together? Right. So some of the ways. So I mentioned that there are advantages with this interdependence model. Uh, you could save a lot on resources. And so since Providence, a larger church, they can do the financial um, administration. They can do things like marketing and communications because they have a hub. It's second nature for them. And it would cost home church a lot to do. And so... Um, those are the ways that they're able to save resources, have it almost as a missional outpost, and yet have this kind of uh, dualism with the interdependent and independent. And of course, uh, we've both done a lot of work with uh, Church of the Resurrection. I mean, they're, they're doing this really well, and they're much more on this side where everything looks kind of the same, you know, the same font, the same color. The, they actually... Um, broadcast the preaching so adam is the preacher in all of the the services please hear us we're not saying that franchise is bad and local dive is good uh, we think they both have their advantages uh, what we're trying to help churches shift though is the more that you make the franchise feel like a local dive in other words you make the recipe feel like it connects with that community you translate it in that way uh, you feel authentic to that community and it will grow if you try to impose what the church down the road or a county over or across the state line is trying to do, uh, it's going to look, uh, people will reject that flavor because it's not uh, as authentic. Now we want to get into some of the nitty gritty here for you and talk about what looks the same and what looks different. Uh, Roz mentioned this a moment ago, but one of the best places you can start in figuring out this continuum is to write together a letter of intent or a covenant agreement, or you might even call it a purpose statement. What is the relationship between what exists now and what it is that we're creating? Whether that be a new worship service, a new campus, a new ministry, whatever that is, uh, what is the relationship going to look like? And, and that uh, can involve uh, many things, but here's, this is sometimes a dirty word in the church, but I think <laughs> we have to be honest and say it. Who is your target audience? And I say that's a dirty word because we often will say, well, we just want to reach everybody. I was coaching a church in um, Idaho, and uh, I was there doing a secret worshiper consultation one weekend, and they said, you know, our, our biggest service is our, our kind of boomer service. I called that the uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary service when I went to it. They did, they did songs that are popular on the radio today, and they all sound like Peter, Paul, and Mary. I don't know how you make Gunger sound like Peter, Paul, and Mary, but they did. Um, but that was okay. It was who they were. But they also had a service that is kind of their millennial service that had, um, you know, maybe 50 people in it. And they said, how can we get more millennials in our, they didn't call it their Peter, Paul, and Mary service, but in our, our boomer service. And I said, why do you want to do that? 
why don't you fully engage and live into, own the fact that you are doing this boomer oriented service and then fully own that you're this other thing and, and live into that target and live into the other, but don't, don't try and have one reach the other or, or vice versa because you're gonna be inauthentic to either of those two groups. So figuring out who it is you're targeting. Is it young families? Is it millennials? Is it boomers? Um, fully embrace whoever the target is and as you're writing that covenant agreement, there sometimes is tension that it exists if you don't name that you're trying to reach different audiences. So if you have a traditional worship, and that's where you're spending most of your energy now, and you're going to start something that's non-traditional, that's a different audience. So it means you're going to carry things out in a different way. And if you don't name the target, there will be tension all the time about we're going to bring guitars in the set. Well, now we're going to put lights in the, we're going to put screens in our sanctuary. You know, those are all things that follow the target. And if you don't determine the target, it's, it's very hard to figure out where you're at on this continuum. Um, another is governing structure. I know that sounds evil, but, you know, who's going to be your leadership team, essentially? Um, you know, um, if it's a, a different service, let's say, it'll be important to have more of an advisory council or group that'll help you at the outset to cast vision for it. Um, and that's important so you can get buy-in, you have feet on the street, uh, you have people that are invested, almost treating it as a launch team, but for your leaders as well. If it's another campus, um, then of course, um, you'll wanna have the essential functions that are required in the Book of Discipline, like SPRC, finance, trustees. Um, but as long as those groups are represented in the leadership board at large, that is important or else one group is gonna feel like they're the outcast. And so whether it's that new service you're starting, identifying those leaders, because who can nominate people to be on your board? Whose nominations? You, right? You get to nominate. So having those people that can get on your board that really get fired up about this new thing you're starting or trying to revitalize, so having them on that board to have a voice is important. Again, if you've never done this before, you might think, why are we spending so much time on this? This is what I have seen happen in multiple churches that I've coached and worked with. When you don't figure this out, when the new thing starts to grow or starts to get attention or resources start to go in that direction, uh, the people who are part of the old thing, the franchise, start to get upset about why are we, I want to be part of, why are they getting all the attention, you know, whatever. The more, you, more work you do in the deployment of strategizing the relationship, the less tension you will have. And I know I'm saying that multiple times, but I just want you to hear that. I want to save you the heartache that we have experienced. I was at a church one time that called itself One Church in Two Locations. And there was just constant tension because we didn't work things, these things out. So the new flash in the pan, exciting thing was constantly battling with the old thing because we didn't do the work and it nearly killed the ministry that we were doing until we finally stopped and said, let's, let's figure this thing out because we got to get on the same page. We're not on the same page. Um, student ministry is also something that's important. How's that going to work for your, your new thing? Uh, again, if you're doing a, a, a new worship service, um, what sometimes happens is that we have everything, I see this in a lot of churches I work with, that are revitalizing. Uh, you have everything established to support the traditional experience. And then you say, we're going to add a second service, but you don't add any kind of children's uh, ministry activities or uh, Sunday school or anything like that. Well, if you're trying to reach young families, and you might think, well, they can just come in and we'll give them a busy bag. You know, I don't want my kid to sit in worship in color. I want my kid to get a Christian education, and I'm more drawn toward non-traditional worship than I am traditional. I appreciate traditional worship, but where I really feel it, and I want my kids to have that experience, but if I have to go to the traditional service so my kids can go to Sunday school or, or children's worship, uh, then you force people to make a really hard choice. Uh, so you really have to support those two things uh, intentionally. You want to say something about music? Uh, you're the music. I mean, uh, you're the... Uh, we could talk about music, too. 
<laughs> music is, all, is, is also really important. And uh, this is another thing that I, I see all the time in churches that are revitalizing or starting new worship experiences. Uh, we will sometimes um, start something new and then just make the leader of the established thing the leader of the new thing. So like a classically trained um, <laughs> musician who is a choir director does not make the best, quote, contemporary worship leader. It's not the style they're familiar with. It's not, or what you might even do is bring in a uh, contemporary worship leader, a worship pastor, and then put them under the, the, contemporary, or the traditional worship leader. And those tensions exist because that person doesn't live in that world. That's not what speaks to them. Uh, so what I want you to hear is the more you make that part interdependent or de independent, um, the better results you will get. I have seen churches that never get their uh, contemporary worship firing on all cylinders because you've got the, the folks who are tied to tradition stopping it at every opportunity they can because they're trying to protect the tradition. You've got to allow those two things to be separate and apart and give um, some level of autonomy to those who are creating the new thing. Uh, again, some of you are nodding, I see. Some of you may have had this experience. Some of you want to throw something at me, and that's okay too. Uh, but this is, this is really important um, as you're starting something new. And, uh, you know, there's opportunities for mutual trainings when it comes to the interdependence. So if you have two services happening in your um, worshiping community, then you can do things like student ministry or kids ministry training for workers or hospitality greeters, those kinds of things. So interdependent, you might move your training over to that because you want to be as resourceful as possible. Uh, hospitality is another concern. Um, is hospitality at what is established going to look the same as what you are establishing new? And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you have greeters, uh, frontline hospitality folks, uh, does it look the same way at traditional as it does non-traditional or that new campus? Do you have a, a first-time visitor gift? Does that look the same at a non You know, many of us have that, like, ceramic coffee mug with our logo printed on it with hardtack candy in the bottom of it, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is, like, stuffed six months ago. I can't tell how often I bit into a Werther's original. It was, like, the original one that Werther's yeah. made. I, about break my, I worship in a lot of churches. That might work in a traditional setting, but in, if you're in a non-traditional setting, you know, maybe you have more of like a sports uh, water bottle, you know, something that feels a little more contemporary. If, you're ha if you have a contemporary community, make the way that you do hospitality feel more contemporary. Uh, and if you have a more of a traditional uh, mindset, then maybe you do some things that are more traditional. Um, I think way too often the reason that our local dives don't thrive is that there's not enough distinction between them. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Let but, me chime in yeah. um, on that. So uh, what we do at Mosaic Church, is, instead of giving the coffee mug, we give a donation and a person's honor to one of our four nonprofits that we partner with. And so we're you know just about the community. So uh, Beaver Creek's Parks and Rec, um, Joshua Recovery Ministry, which is a sober living home. They have about eight throughout the Dayton area. House for All Nations is a nonprofit we started, and that's to create friendship among uh, refugees and immigrants. And then uh, the fourth one, can't remember the fourth one right off the top of my head. But anyway, when they check in, um, they can mark where their donation goes, and we give it in their honor. And it's amazing how many people actually fill out a Connect card. And that's an idea I ripped off, but we made it low. I, I see restaurants giving back in the same way. And so I thought, why can't the church do that? I haven't shared this with you yet, but yeah. this was one of the churches that I've done some coaching work with. And this combines your idea with a visual way to represent that. And I thought yeah. I'd share it with you because this was pretty cool. This church has four glass boxes. Hmm. Their logo is orange. So they put an orange ping pong ball in. So this is their Soldier's Alliance Awaken. I don't know what PCEI stands for or the Network. Palos Care Network. So every time a new visitor comes and fills out, that's where I want my donation to go, they stick it in one of those things. And this exists out in their welcome area. So here, here's two really cool things about that. Number one, there's a visual representation of all the visitors we've had recently. 
we're growing, we're doing exciting things. Number two, I think there's part of me, there's a, a part of me that's just a little skeptical. If I fill out that card, are you really giving $2 in my name? And there's something about visualizing it to see that those, those ping pong balls are growing. And there's something about this for me that I don't feel like you'd, you'd put a ping pong ball in there if you weren't really given that money. Mm -hmm. So there's an idea That's for, you, great, to, I'm idea for you, you to steal. Yep. Um, last thing I would say about this is that there is some evidence to suggest that young people, millennials, uh, are not interested in a tchotchke with your logo printed on it. Like, why would you give me a coffee mug mm -hmm. with your logo on it? Why not give this money to the poor? Mm -hmm. So I talk about it. I have a different seminar I do. Some of you may have even been to it. It's a, called Five Things Your Visitors Are Thinking But Won't Ask. So here's what I like to suggest. We're, I'm just going to veer into this for just a second. First of all, the ceramic coffee mug it gets tossed most of the time. Uh, somebody told me the other day that they were at a thrift store and they saw six different church coffee mugs at the thrift store uh, because people, how many of you already have a cabinet at home with way too many coffee mugs in it? You know, like, am I going to take your mug home? That's going to become my favorite one if I'm a first time visitor? Probably not. But if you do kind of a nice thermal coffee mug, I might actually hang on to that and take it to and from work with me because it keeps my drink warm or cold. Uh, not everybody drinks coffee though, so having a nice water bottle that you might put on or having that uh, donation card where we'll donate money in your name. Here's one other thing to consider. You do all of these or two of these and you have a connect card where there's a choice on the bottom. Check the one that you'd like and bring it to our welcome center after worship. We want to get to know you. We want to meet you. You will have way more people come because I get to pick what I want <laughs> and, and I'll show up and I'll hand it. How often do you find that people don't fill those cards out? You know, fill it out because I mean, who cares about the coffee, <laughs> the, the ceramic coffee mug? So again, we're, we're getting into other territory here for a moment, but um, think about hospitality and how that relates. And then why don't you say something about that last one there and we will move on. Yeah, the teaching and preaching. And so um, are you going to do the same sermon series? Is it going to be um, kind of the big idea where you get together with that other communicator, or maybe you are that communicator, is the sermon going to look the same from the previous service of what is already going on to this new worshiping community? And so, again, when we started Mosaic Church, we were doing our own series, uh, which caused some friction. But when I revitalized uh, an existing campus at Ginghamsburg, I had some flexibility because not a lot translated. Um, because I was in a community that was 80% African American coming, you know, so we we're getting the main uh, sermon series from Tip City. We we're giving input for that. However, not everything translated, and so we would preach live instead of video venue because people wanted that relatability. And I remember you telling me uh, early on when he got there, they were doing a series uh, on stewardship called The Christian Wallet. Well, the Christian wallet means something completely different to upper middle class people than it does to uh, lower class people that were in the, the very broken neighborhoods that you were ministering in. So even that, there was a little bit of tension at first around, well, why wouldn't you do that series? And we've already got all the branding and graphic material So I done. said, I'm not calling it that. <laughs> and so, yeah, so they did a different series. Um, but some of that, that relationship uh, wasn't mapped out. Last thing then is uh, communications. What's communications going to look like between the old and the new? Um, particularly branding. This is a big one. Uh, is it going to look the same or is it going to look different? Uh, I was just back in February uh, consulting um, for the Great Plains Conference. They had me come do a few seminars and then secret worship at one of their church starts. It's a church start called uh, Renew Aldersgate. Uh, it's the Renew campus of the Aldersgate Church. And I went there, and uh, in the front yard, there's this really nice-looking modern-day logo with a tree and some fruit growing on it. And I uh, went in and opened up the bulletin, and the bulletin had the URL for their website on it. Well, I or I, on my phone, went to the website because I just wanted to see what their website looked like. And it was the brand of the uh, main campus, and it was kind of the old United Methodist Church logo. I couldn't find the Renew logo anywhere on it. Um, the other thing that was really confusing is the bulletin had on it a list of the, uh, the staff, and it listed first the senior pastor, which was the senior pastor of the Aldersgate main campus, who doesn't even preach there. So it said senior pastor, you know, Joe Schmo, and then it said Aldersgate uh, campus pastor. And 
I was confused at first because I didn't know the pastor there that, um, who, is that guy the lead pastor or is he like a substitute pastor or whatever? And, and so they didn't, this church had a hard time separating the branding of the two things and it was very confusing. I told them, you know, you really need to have your own website. You really need to remove the lead pastor. You can list it somewhere else if you want, but there was just confusion around uh, what the relationship was between what the old thing and the new thing. As a side note, North Point now is moving toward that model where their campus pastors are actually called uh, lead pastors because campus pastor in the secular world doesn't mean anything, but lead pastor does or senior pastor. And so uh, that's what they're being called now. And um, they're actually doing more of a hybrid model in their preaching and teaching. So it's not just Andy Stanley anymore because I think he's probably going to be retiring in the next few years, and so they're getting ready for that. So at least six to eight times a year, uh, there will be live teaching and preaching from that lead pastor, that campus pastor. So our reflection question for you here is, uh, as you're thinking about the relationship between the old and the new, uh, what are some of the non-negotiables that have to be included in your local dive? Uh, what are some of the non-negotiables that your local dive must include in its recipe? And the second question to think about is how much autonomy is going to be given to that new thing, whether that be a campus or a worship service. Um, we'll give you like a minute to, to think about that, to chat with your neighbor if you want, to write a thought down about that. But uh, go ahead and begin now. All right, that's your minute. You get to have as much discussion as you want later on, on the rest of this conversation. So, <laughs> And we um, encourage that. Yes, absolutely. All right, moving on to our third ingredient. Oh, that's our third question. Don't look at that. There we go. Third, third ingredient uh, is to uh, find your local flavor. Uh, what, what is the local flavor that you're going to create? You want to speak to what you mean by cultural yeah. exegesis? Um, you're, you're finding, when you find your local flavor, that cultural exegesis piece. So um, when you're exegeting scripture, you're looking at scripture, you're looking at authorship, intent, maybe you're doing a word study and all that. So that's what exegesis is. It's coming from the text. And hermeneutics is how you apply the text, right? Well, this relates to our culture or community. Um, and so it's more than just having mission insight or some sort of um, data where you can look at demographics. It's actually having feet on the street. And I do this in three easy questions, and I've done this in every community I've lived in. Um, first of all, I practice something that we call incarnational ministry. And so whatever community that I'm pastoring, I try to live in it. So the community that I was pastoring with 80% African American, guess what? Moved right in the neighborhood, worked out where they worked out, same restaurants. When I had hair, I'd go to the barber shop, um, you know, all that fun stuff. And I got to know the people there. So Jesus was a Jew, of course, uh, you know, circumcised on the eighth day, took on the dietary laws and Sabbath, fully a Jew. Um, Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase, the message in John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The word of God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Moved into the neighborhood. And so uh, when we practice that cultural exegesis piece, it's being in the community. And so an easy way to do this is uh, go on a police ride along. If you want to know uh, what's going on in your community, 
Go on a police ride along. Now don't get arrested. Don't, to do yeah, that. Like, right. <laughs> get to know teachers, go to community events. And so I ask three questions when I'm with people. I'm not like writing it down, but I'm taking mental notes and then maybe write some things after. Um, I, the first thing I ask is, what are the greatest strengths in the community? Why do you think I start with strengths? Because you're smart. Because I'm smart. Because every community has strengths. Every community has something to offer. If we believe in God's prevenient grace, God is at work in a community long before we ever have arrived on the scene or our churches. So we always start with what is the greatest strength. So in the case of uh, when I was pastoring a campus of Ginghamsburg called The Point, I knew one of the strengths was there was great community pride. The sports teams, uh, the high school sports, they were state champions. So I knew those were some of the strengths. The needs, of course, um, we had Walmart, Target, all those places shut down in our community. It was a food desert. Um, you know, with the tornadoes that just came through, it got hit hard. So there is great need. Um, but one of the things that the police officer told me was there's a lot of single parents um, and single grandparents raising their grandkids. And a lot of the kids are getting in trouble because they simply don't have anything to do after school or in the community. Um, another need, of course, was they built a brand new library but had no books. So those were some of the needs. So based on the strengths and the needs, this is where the opportunities come in. This is where they intersect. This is what should dictate our ministries are what the needs are in the community. And so we did a book drive. We got in 5,000 books. Um, people have a ton of used books that they don't, they don't need. And so we did that. We started a block party for the community. They hadn't had a block party in 30 years. Um, we started an after school program. Uh, we did uh, something called The Beat, which was um, a dance party for like um, elementary kids. And we'd have many people come in that had never been to the church before simply because we were providing a need. But I wouldn't have known that unless I was asking these questions. The greatest strength, needs, and opportunities. Yeah, I remember one of the most popular things, two, two of the most, well, three, three things that stick out to me. One was he organized a community kickball tournament between the police officers and the kids in the community. You didn't say mm -hmm. that right. I was typing out these questions. No, that's good. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, second thing, uh, and that was so much fun for those kids, and it was a great way to build relationships between the police in the area, the kids in the neighborhood, and the church. And guess what? A lot of this stuff's free. Yeah. Second you thing think of. is, uh, I remember you did a movie night. So mm -hmm. these kids who don't ever get to go to the movies, you know, these are kids that could never afford to go to the movies. Uh, you pop popcorn, you did hot dogs. Uh, there's a, a park there in the community. Uh, you showed a movie on the big screen at nighttime, like a drive-in kind of thing. Uh, and the third thing, I remember this was really popular. I don't know if you have these here, but you had the Kona ice truck come in. It's this uh, snow cone machine, and the kids could go up and get whatever they wanted, and the church basically covered the cost of that truck being there that day. Uh, and, and the relationships that that built between the church and the community, uh, they're, they're still feeling that in that community. Mm -hmm. So And the cup, uh, you were impressed with the cupcakes and canvases yeah, thing that we did. Yes, mainly because the, your painting, it was so good. I know. We did this for, um, for, for women in the congregation who wanted to come out on Valentine's Day. Maybe they didn't have a significant other. Again, we had a lot of, um, predominantly in our congregation, a lot of African-American churches, a lot of women. And so... Nothing happening for them. So on Valentine's Day, we did this. I didn't. I didn't make anything, but I. I facilitate. You I help facilitate. Cupcakes. Yeah, I, I put the sprinkles down. So yeah, there you go. and that was something great that that really happened in meeting those needs. Uh, we were talking uh, when we were writing the book with uh, another. I think he's actually been to your area to do some training. Matt Miofsky. He's the uh, lead pastor of the Gathering Churches. Uh, one of our another one of our fastest growing churches in Methodism uh, from St. Louis. And uh, Matt and I were talking and he was, he was saying that uh, one of the ways that uh, you do incarnational ministry is when you choose your leaders for whatever it is that you're doing new, whether it be a new service, new campus, is to make sure they have a local connection. Uh, if your leaders don't have a local connection, they may never um, connect with the community. Or you have to find people that can adopt that community as their own. He said everybody can sniff out somebody who's just there to get some experience. 
This is my first appointment out of, you know, bring somebody in. I'm going to get two years of experience and move on to something bigger. Uh, when you move into the community, it says something to the community that I am, I'm with you. We are in this thing together. Um, so that was, that was a big one. He also pointed out, he said, one of my observations has been that most of our most successful churches, uh, our mega churches, our, our churches that have been around for a long time, uh, have leaders who were from the community and hung around a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Adam Hamilton started Church of the Resurrection out of a funeral home. And it, I mean, look at it now. Uh, Mike Slaughter basically was from the Dayton, Cincinnati area, started Ginghamsburg there. Uh, Rick Warren, Saddleback, you know, all these people kind of hung where they knew. So uh, Matt was telling me that as they're starting their next campus, they're not even necessarily looking for an ordained elder to do it. They're looking for someone from the community uh, to raise up even as a licensed local pastor to lead that community because they feel like that connection is better than hiring a headhunter to bring somebody in from some other part of the country to come lead that campus. So I think that gives you great opportunity. It doesn't mean that you have to have the, the best credentials necessarily, not that those don't matter, but finding someone with a local connection means a whole lot when you're starting something new. Uh, he also mentioned to us uh, one exception to the rule. He said, uh, I think about another friend of ours, uh, a guy named Scott Crostick, pastor named Scott Crostick. Scott is uh, the campus pastor at the Resurrection Church of the Resurrection downtown campus in Kansas City. And Scott is actually from Detroit. Uh, he moved from Detroit. Uh, he didn't move to Leewood, where uh, mm -hmm. the main campus is of Church of the Resurrection. He said, I intentionally moved into the inner city, where mm -hmm. it's loud and noisy and the traffic is awful, but I wanted to live into the, in the community that we were going to plant in. Uh, one of his strategies to be incarnational is he said, I write my sermons at a coffee shop. Yeah. It's the worst way to write a sermon. Because mm -hmm. all day long I had people coming and interrupting me and I bump into them. But he said, it forces me to be in the community, to hear the needs of the people. I get sermon material out of the conversations we have. Uh, I go out of my way to not be in the office. I know this was a strategy you used, you used oh, a lot. I met my wife at a coffee shop. I mean, at Starbucks, we met. As a pastor. As a pastor, yes. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a strategy I used. Um, I made it in my office, uh, different coffee establishments, restaurants, bars, wherever it may be, so I could just interact with folks. In fact, in the past, I don't know, few years, I've never used an office. Still, even at the seminary, um, I sit in the lobby and I hang out because it's a ministry of presence. Yeah, we talk about, um, and this is something for you to think about if you are trying to do something new um, and you want it to have a different feel. We talk about finding third spaces. Yep. Uh, so talk a little so bit about So your, you know, Alan Hirsch um, really helped coin this, but your first space is your home, really, uh, because you spend probably the most time there. Some of us don't, uh, but more than likely your home. Second place is uh, your, your job, where you work. And then the third place is your leisure place, the place that you choose to go to. So whether it's, uh, you know, coffee shop, movie theater, restaurant, wherever that may be. And so third spaces offer a great variety for folks. Um, again, I've started two churches in movie theaters, and then my other church met in the YMCA. And then I had another church I revitalized that was in a brick and mortar church. So whatever the wineskin is, God can definitely use it. But it's just a creative way to do something a little bit different. One of my favorite examples of this, I'm working with a church right now in um, Urbana, Ohio. And this was a really neat third space that they wanted to give as a gift to the community. But they're going to start a new worship service there. They took this old theater, kind of an old Victorian style theater, and they completely uh, revitalized it. You know, they went and renovated everything. And so Gloria had meaning to this community, but it had shut down for a long time, and they've restored it to a new condition. Uh, it's a nonprofit run by the church that they use for community uh, events. So they only show movies on the weekends. They got to show Avengers, and like the whole town came out for it. <laughs> um, and they talked about how it's a gift to the community. But now that they're starting a new worship service there, uh, people have come to that theater so regularly for both movies and then community events and things like that. It's a space that doesn't feel threatening to those on the mm -hmm. outside. They're already comfortable. They yeah. already go there. It's so, normal. So, you know, sometimes our tendency is to think we're going to start a new worship service. Let's do it in the sanctuary. Well, you, you might have a sanctuary 
that doesn't really fit the style of worship you're going to do. Stained glass windows and, and pipe organ and you know all that. And that's wonderful for the expression of worship that is traditional. But if you're trying to create something that somebody who just came out of the bar uh, is, is looking to go into, a, a theater, a coffee shop, uh, you know, um, pints and uh, well, pies and pints. There's a place in our, our, uh, where we live that's, I know, a study that meets there. Uh, Bible and brew, you know, some people are, I, they, don't, they don't serve any non-Methodist drinks there, I don't think. But um, <laughs> So think about what are some of those uh, third spaces. In fact, we'll get to our reflection question here for you. Uh, you've heard us kind of talk through all these, but as you're thinking about starting something new, do your leaders have a local connection? If not, can they learn to adopt the area, fall in love with it? And then uh, as you think about where you're trying to do something new, are there third spaces that are available to you? We'll give you like 30 seconds to write down. <laughs> we're, we're, we're close to our, we're in it, we end at 4.30, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're getting close to the end of our mm -hmm. time. So if you want to jot down an idea or two about that. All right, our fourth ingredient is that you have to determine what kind of dive you are going to create, whatever that uh, looks like. Um, what, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and it's gonna look different. I mean, it's not gonna be uh, the same thing as the church down the street. It's what God is uniquely calling you to do. And so uh, when I got the vision to start Mosaic Church, it was simply, uh, to create a dynamic mosaic of Jesus followers. That was our vision and to live out Revelation 7, 9, that every tongue, tribe, and nation would come together and worship the Lord. And so we, in our worship celebrations, uh, we've spoken nearly 40 languages in worship. So that's through prayers, it's through singing, through reading of scripture, but to really capture the uniqueness of calling it mosaic, we wanted to, to demonstrate it through uh, these mosaic tiles. So this is even before we started Mosaic Church, we had these tiles and people would write down uh, a name of a person that they're praying for or a prayer that they had. And later we would make mosaics out of them. And so I think we have like 10 mosaics somewhere, um, but that's what we made. And then even in our first service, our launch service on September 17th, we um, had a potter there who was uh, making the clay pot, and then all of a sudden, uh, during the sermon, grabbed it and broke it, and it shattered, and just symbolizing our brokenness, and then that kind of formed and came together, and we made a mosaic out of that, but it was just to symbolize how um, there are times we experience brokenness, and even though we're broken, God can put us together, but we're made to be better together, that we all need each other. We're not to be independent solely, but interdependent together. One of the things I want you to hear about all of that is that um, the vision was strong ahead of time, like they knew who they were trying to reach. Like if you go to Mosaic, every single week you go to Mosaic, there's always going to be a scripture, a prayer, some moment that is in an, a, another language. Uh, one of the um, major, oh. Dang man, sounds, tornado warning. Take shelter now. I hope not. Um, one, one of the major uh, projects that they're working on is these English as a second language uh, classes. Uh, so they do a lot of coaching around that. But I want you to hear uh, one of the essential pieces of mosaic is the image of the mosaic. Um, think about how are you going to wrap whatever you're doing in that familiar story or image or metaphor um, that, that people understand. Most of our growing United Methodist churches right now it used to be that we named ourselves on how quickly we got to town. First United Methodist Church, second United Methodist Church. You know, now the more we embrace sort of a visual, uh, we are 67% visual learners as a culture, according to a 2008 study. And learning increases by 400% when you use image to teach. So when you wrap your identity in that metaphor, so um, 
Matt Miofsky's church is called The Gathering. Um, one of our fastest growing United Methodist churches is, is called Embrace. If you're trying to say to your community, if you're isolated, we want to embrace you. Crossroads is one of the uh, fastest growing churches in our area and in the Cincinnati uh, area. Uh, think about what is that central image or metaphor that you can use that will help you uh, to communicate that to your, your community. Uh, also, I think we got to be careful about uh, category. Sometimes we try to plug our new thing into a certain category that already exists like traditional or non-traditional or blended or modern or boomer or whatever. Uh, don't be so concer uh, consider, uh, concerned about the label that you put on it as you are about creating something that is genuine and authentic. The thing is, I, I do, um, as I said, I travel all the time. Almost every weekend I'm gone somewhere. And uh, I've seen so many different worship experiences, and I've never seen anything quite like Mosaic. Mosaic is its own thing. Uh, I don't go to uh, any other church where they read Scripture in different languages. Uh, they, they sometimes sing songs in different languages. I uh, want to share with you very quickly here one of my favorite worship experiences last year. Uh, was at a church in San Diego at a church called Normal Heights United Methodist Church. Uh, this is what their sanctuary looks like. They took the rows. This is an old United Methodist Church building. Took all the rows out and they moved all the pews to face center. So the entire room is now facing the middle. So these pews are all this way, this way. Um, people actually set up front here. Here's another view of it from up high. You can kind of see how the pews all move toward the middle. Um, People actually set up in what used to be the chancel uh, on, on the, the floor down there. Um, when it came time for uh, the scripture reading, this church is really, their focus is on, uh, I'm bouncing through all these pictures. Let me see if I can find the picture of, is it here? You can't, okay. One of these pictures I have. Uh, this guy over here stands up and reads the scripture. So, you know, didn't come up to the center in the front. This church is all about community. They want to create a sense of community. One of the things they did was an extended community time. Uh, that, I think, would be introvert hell uh, for my wife, who is an introvert. But they do it in such a way that they said, here are some options for you. If you're new here and you're not quite comfortable with that uh, quite yet, we just invite you to have a personal time of prayer. You can maybe just... Uh, uh, Pray right there at your seat, you know, bow your head, do whatever you'd like. Uh, here are some different options for you. One, we have our recreation of the uh, wailing wall. And here's an opportunity for you to write prayers on paper and you can kind of stuff them in the cracks uh, like the wailing wall. Um, we have another station where uh, we do, they wouldn't have called it this, but intercessory prayer. So today we're praying for baby Grace, who was born nine weeks early. Um, write a prayer on the heart and you can stick it on our prayer wall here, uh, say a prayer for baby Grace. If you'd like to pray for somebody else or you want a prayer for yourself, you can write on that and face it, uh, put it on there facing the wall, and we will pray for you this week in addition to praying for baby Grace. Uh, they had this uh, other area in the church where they said, uh, if you've got your kids with you, um, they can go to the back where we have an area where the kids are, there's a question on the board, what does the kingdom of God look like? There were markers, pencils, they even said, if you'd like to paint today during worship, we have canvases and paints, if that's the way you'd like to take notes. Um, during this extended community time, they've turned, that says conversation space, you can't see it very well, but they've created these conversation spaces uh, for people to converse. Um, when you walk in, they have a collection of coffee mugs that are all different. It's like going to someone's home that's not all one with a logo on the side of it, but they have locally sourced coffee from the neighborhood. There's a a place in the neighborhood that creates um, or makes coffee. Uh, the way that they did song lyrics on the screen, they had uh, song lyrics projected on this side and on that wall, so no matter where you were sitting, uh, everybody was engaged in the experience. And then when the pastor went to preach, um, or the band was singing, they sing in a circle. There's not a line of people in the front. We're an audience there up front. The pastor says, I don't want to be a sage from the stage. I want to be a member of a conversation, and I'll help lead that conversation. So when he preaches, do I have a picture of him preaching? Yeah, there he is. Uh, he preaches from the center of the room, and he's never, you know, sometimes he might be facing the back of you. Uh, this service they call the sacred ordinary worship. The idea is that we take the ordinary into the sacred, and we take the sacred back out into the ordinary. So he starts with the parable. They do this community time like it's like 10 or 15 minutes where you interact with people 
and then you come back, you hear a sermon. Uh, there were even two dogs that were walking around, uh, little basset hounds. <laughs> and so if you walked by this church, this is in San Diego, they kept all the doors open. It was like there was a, a party at somebody's house going on that you mm. might feel uh, the invitation to go in and be a part of. Now, the reason I share this uh, with you is that it, you don't have to do the, the smoke machines and the lights to do something that's not traditional. This is not, I wouldn't call this contemporary worship. It's something holy. It's a recipe that is all their own. And what we wanted you to hear today is that you can create a recipe like this that connects with your community to be authentically who you are. We are getting close to our time here, so we will get to our reflection questions. Is that all we were going to say about this? Yes. Um, so here are, our, we've got a few of them here. Um, as, as Roz was thinking about um, what took place in staffing for a multi-ethnic church, uh, what role does diversity, oh, uh, pla, pla. pla. <laughs> I was finishing this graphic uh, about 10 minutes before we got in here because uh, we decided to add these reflection questions. Um, I can, I can do church better than I can spell. Uh, how can you reimagine or reconfigure your space to facilitate community? So one of the things that they did was move all the pews to the facing center. Uh, it wasn't about completely renovating and taking the pews out completely. It was about reconfiguring. Uh, how can you bring that sacred into the ordinary and the ordinary into the sacred when it's all over? Um, I have a whole workshop that I do. And I'll be back in July to do my creative worship workshop. A uh, couple times. So if you haven't ever been to that, come join us. We create resources, but you'll learn all about uh, that sacred ordinary kind of idea. And then lastly, uh, can, you, can your church uh, live outside the standard of traditional, contemporary, and blended labels to create a recipe that is wholly your own, that is you? All right, last Last question here, Roz. <laughs> or last ingredients. Last ingredients, sorry. So it's last time to make the winning recipe. Yes. We're going to share with you uh, four ingredients. We, we really only have time to hit this. There's a book coming out. You get to read about this in detail. <laughs> when, we said, when they told us we had 90 minutes to get through all this material, we were like, okay, we'll do our best. Um, so we're just going to kind of touch on it, and, uh, and then you know we'll, we'll be back at some point. I'll be back at some point anyway. Um, so we're going to, we didn't talk about these these five ingredients. We think that worship, guest readiness or hospitality, uh, community building, discipleship and mission are all essential ingredients in uh, creating a recipe that will bring people back. We cannot assume that just because they came to our launch service, they're gonna come back. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let's talk very quickly about um, worship. Uh, nope, those are next steps. I must not have imported the worship graphic. So there are five or six essential um, pieces of worship that we want to hit very quickly here that we think are really important. No matter what in what uh, kind of worship space you're in, uh, these six things are uh, the environment. Uh, you you oftentimes cannot create. Um, you can't change your space. I think I have a graphic that I can import really quick. There we go. Uh, the environment. Uh, so if you're in a, a room with uh, stained glass and pipe organs, uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But you can do creative things with that space in order to, to make it feel, uh, to spice up your recipe, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, so why don't you talk about what yeah, you did? We're, with... in, we're in a movie theater, and so um, we did a series called Baggage Check. And so we had different, you know, luggages and a variety all um on the stage. We don't have a lot of room on the stage, but that helped carry the metaphor. And then we had these uh, ticket items, these baggage check tickets, and then we had people write some of the things that they want to give up to the Lord. And so we had them turn them in almost as prayer requests. Yeah, didn't, you had uh, open, open, open suitcases at the and front. And people could drop them in the suitcases. What is something you need to let God carry for you? Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, one, another church I was at one time was talking about uh, Christ standing at the door of our heart and knocking. And so they had all kinds of different doors up front. Um, some of you may remember uh, we did a thing here at, uh, for Bishop's Day Apart. Some of you are part of that where we use Play-Doh as a metaphor. And somebody I still, and it's my favorite prop ever for worship, uh, somebody 
took a five gallon bucket and spray painted it yellow and we put a, a label on it that looked like a giant Play-Doh container. And there was a moment where we gave everyone an opportunity to kind of sculpt that into what they felt like God was reshaping them to become. Uh, so environment, uh, how can you make the environment um, conducive to uh, making worship uh, last? Uh, second thing that is music. And this is one of those areas where, again, if you're starting something new, please do something new. Uh, I see a lot of churches that start what they call contemporary worship, loosely using the word contemporary. I one time heard Tony Campolo say, have you ever considered the root of contemporary is temporary? So that's a good point. Now, some of you would it's say It's actually no. contempt. Contempt, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some of you might say yeah. it's actually contempt. Uh, Still not good. The, the, the worship that you do, if it's truly contemporary, should be from the last five or ten years. I go to work, ten is even stretching it, it a bit. Yeah. I have been to so many contemporary worship services, and I hear songs like, you know, Shine, Jesus, Shine, or Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. Like, that was contemporary when I was in, like, fifth grade or something. Like, that, if you're going to do, like, camp-style worship, that's fine. But if you're doing contemporary worship, it's got to be truly contemporary. So the music you pick uh, matters. That may not be the expression you're creating. That might not be the recipe, but the music is essential. Uh, theme set up in liturgy. Uh, when you're doing creative things in worship, and I wish we had more time to talk about this, you have to really set things up. So I often do this because I have one. Uh, if we're living a half-full lifestyle, um, is this half empty or half full? You could build a whole sermon series around the bottled water, and for uh, you'd have to preach you have to exegete the metaphor, too, so that uh, it's these what I call modern-day mustard seed moments. Uh, you have to do the work, though, of, of setting those, um, those concepts up and really preaching through them. So something like that right now, where we're in a water shortage in Dayton, that could be my sermon series and have everybody bring bottled, pallets of bottled water to us. Which is number six, is missional yeah. application. Uh, you got to give people, if you want them to connect to the recipe... Uh, and, and want to come back for it again and again, you got to give them something to do. I talk about creating action-oriented worship. How can we create a, such a worship experience that when you leave on Sunday, you have some way to participate? Far too often in worship, we are so theoretical and we don't ever get practical. We say, what if we were to live a half-full lifestyle? What if, what if? Well, how do you? Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to show our community what a half-full lifestyle looks like by collecting bottled water for the next four weeks and going to give that to the folks whose homes were just destroyed by the storms on Memorial Day. One of the things you taught me about this, Jason, is having the desired outcome at the beginning. And so that's really helped me in driving that home. Yeah, that's sort of what is the goal? When people leave today, what is the desired outcome? What do we want them to remember? We call this the so what question. When they get in the car, so what are we going to do different? Uh, media integration is just that when you have media stuff on the screen... Uh, or in worship, you actually have to integrate that into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I see so many worship services where the screen is just random stuff, and there's never any mention of it. Uh, I went to an Easter service a while back. The pastor had giant projected on either side of him the theme of that morning. Not once did he ever utter the words of the theme. Never once did you hear him even talk about that theme. And I said, he said, what'd you think? And I said, this was around the time the movie... Um, uh, Captain America and the Winter Soldier came out. And I said, well, you know, Pastor, if I went to the movie uh, Captain uh, America and the Winter Soldier and the Winter Soldier was never in the movie and they never talked about him, but the title of the movie was The Winter Soldier, I would have been really confused. And that's kind of how I felt today because I never heard you talk about... Don't ask him <laughs> for an opinion. I, I, I'm you honest. don't want to hear the honest. I give honest opinions. Uh, and then message tie-ins. Um, and, and we're about at our, we're past our yep. time. Um, but uh, message tie-in is that you have to exegete the metaphor too. You have to do the work of redeeming the metaphor. If you don't, the sermon comes off like it doesn't connect with what you're talking about that day. And I've been to so many worship services where there's cohesiveness up until the sermon. And then the sermon doesn't, it, you just exegete the scripture and you don't ever get to the metaphor or the creative stuff. And so it's like having... Uh, you know, Mexican for your entire meal, and then you bring out some other completely different food that doesn't tie in with the way a, a, a chef would design your meal, uh, so to speak. So all that to say, go and cook something great. <laughs> That's right.
more, more yeah take what you have and make something great mm -hmm. with it so that is our time thank you for giving us a few minutes of grace um, and uh, you can connect with us later if you'd like uh, you we'll want be to hanging out we'll be hanging out well I'm here until Saturday but uh, do you want to give them your an email address where they can contact yeah, you? Yeah, Roz, R-O-Z, at wearemosaic.org. Feel free to hit me up. I'll give you my phone number, too. You can text me. Don't call me, though. Um, yeah, I'm one of those guys. 859 area code, 321-9076. And uh, you can get me at Jason, J-A-S-O-N, at... Midnight, this is really long, Midnight Oil Productions with an S. Unfortunately, the Australian rock band owns MidnightOil.com. Uh, Jason at MidnightOilProductions.com. And uh, I'm not giving you my phone number. Uh, I get, the truth is I won't answer your call anyway because like five times a day I get calls from all over the country asking me if I want $200,000 line of credit for my business. And uh, you can't tell what calls are real anymore. So... Well, thank you so much. It was great hanging out with you. Uh, thank you. And we're around if you have questions.